Proudly, we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station to bring you this story, as proudly we hail the United States Army. Our story is entitled, Appointment in Mannheim. This is the intriguing account of a soldier stationed in Germany and of the mysterious disappearance of his kid brother. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment, but first... Did you know that you can get ahead, enjoy your work, have security and a steady job, all when you enlist in the United States Army? Why, you'll get your first promotion when you've been in only a few months. There's a wide variety of jobs available, but most important, you'll be helping to preserve the national security of our country. Why don't you check at your local recruiting office and let them tell you how you can make the most of your life in the United States Army. And now your United States Army presents the proudly we hail production, Appointment in Mannheim. The training day is drawing to a close. The platoon is seated on the ground in the shade of the barracks. When this class is over, everyone will start cleaning weapons and equipment, dress for retreat, hit the chow line, and then take it easy in the PX, or maybe head out for town. You'd think everyone would be anxious for this last lecture to be over, because it has been a long day. But this is the best class of them all. And perhaps the reason for it is, Platoon Sergeant Rhodes is teaching it. All right, now believe it or not, but disengage. Yes, I said disengage. When they wrote the manual, they sure picked the right word for it. It's pretty much the same as being engaged to a girl. How do you break off an engagement? How, in other words, do you disengage? Hastings, you're the Romeo of this outfit. You'll agree with me when I say it takes uh, finesse. It takes talent, sorry. Right you are. And so when your platoon is in a firefight and you want to disengage, it takes doing. The enemy isn't just going to let you withdraw. You can't break off the fight unless you prepare for it. Now... If you have a section of heavy 30 supporting you, the section leader will pull back one gun to the new position. The other will remain to give supporting fire. As each squad pulls back, the remaining squads deliver rapid fire. When your squad reaches its new position in the rear, it has to be ready to cover the other squads coming back. Now, tomorrow we're going to do this in the field. You're going to find out the hard way that it's more trouble to retreat than it is to advance. So therefore, tomorrow when we do this problem, I don't want to see any man without his entrenching tool. Because when we pull back, you have to dig new foxholes. Who oh, groaned? Hastings, that's an important part of war. One hole in the ground after another. Sergeant Rhodes, you got a telephone call in the orderly room. Who, me? A phone call? I bet that whack first sergeant ain't gonna let you disengage. All right, Hastings. I forgive you speaking out of turn only because you're a good soldier. Okay, it's about time to break it up. Inside, clean up, get ready for retreat. Yeah. Charlie... What's the phone? It's a guy. He says he's your brother. My brother? Why didn't you say so? Eddie, <laughs> what are you doing in Germany? Hey, Tom, it's great to hear your voice. Yeah, well, what are you doing here? Where are you? I'm in Mannheim. Mannheim? That's only 80 miles away. Tom, I got a terrific job with a film company. Uh -huh. They're doing a picture on location in Paris, and they need some scenes from a couple of European cities. One of them is Mannheim. So they sent me here with a camera to get some background shots. Well, well, look, kid, we have to get together. There's, uh, there's a first sergeant you have to meet. <laughs> What's so special about a first sergeant? I'm going to marry her as soon as we can both get our furloughs. Uh huh? Yeah, look, I, I got a field problem tomorrow, but I can get off on Saturday. Where are you staying? Well, uh, there's some kind of convention going on here, and the hotels are jammed, but I found a nice room in a private house. Now, take down the address. Mm -hmm. 76 Kefertelstrasse. Okay, I got it. Uh, the people's name is Weber. Now, they're a nice couple. He's a photographer, too. His name is Max. So I'll see you on Saturday. 
say you're getting married, huh? Oh, you old rascal. Well, it's about time you took the plunge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 76 Cofredo Strasse. Uh -huh. Mary and I will be there at about 3. Seventy six Cathedral Strasse, this is it, Tom. Mm -hmm. Where'll you meet Eddie Mary? Oh, he's a crazy kid, but you love him. Who are you to call anybody crazy? Oh, he's been a nut on photography all his life. I hope this is the big break for him. Yes. Oh, uh, would you tell Mr. Rhodes, his brother and his future sister in law here? I beg your pardon? Uh, we've come to see Mr. Eddie Rhodes. But there is no Mr. Rhodes here. Excuse me, this is seventy six Cathedral Strasse, isn't it? Yes, but Tom, are you sure Eddie said 76? Uh, is your name Weber? Yes. Uh, Max Weber, and you're a photographer? Yes, but uh, there is no Mr. Rhodes here. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll bet there isn't. Uh, this is Eddie's idea of a practical joke, Mary. He's probably standing behind the door trying to keep from having a fit. All right, come on, wise guy. I'll make you pay for dinner. Here, Max. Margaret, these American soldiers, I'm afraid they have made a mistake. Well, isn't there an American civilian staying with you? Why, why, no. Oh, that Eddie, he can get everybody to play his game. Okay, tell him I was here with Mary and we left. Come on, honey. But now, what? that's the only way to smoke him out. Come on. I'm sure there is a mistake. There is no one staying here. Tom, look, they're not joking. Herr Weber, you, you've never heard of a Mr. Eddie Rhodes? Oh, why, no. Well, why should Eddie call me up and tell me he's staying at this address? Max, it is not right to make these people stand on the steps. Perhaps we can help them. Won't you come in? Oh, come in and, and please have chairs. Thank you. <clears throat> you uh, say your brother is supposed to be staying here in my house? Yes, that's right. He called me up, uh, when was it? Uh, Thursday, yeah. Said he had a room at 76 Cathedralstrasse. People's name was Weber. Well, this is 76 Cathedralstrasse. My name is Weber. But we have no knowledge. Uh, I, I, I am sorry, Sergeant. But my brother wouldn't pull that kind of a practical joke on me. Oh, would he? What am I talking about? I haven't seen the kid in three years. We've both been dying to get together. He wouldn't lie to me. If he said he was staying here, then that's it. Okay, where is he? Now, you, Sergeant, have no right to accuse me and my wife of telling lies. I repeat, we have never seen your brother. We know nothing of him. But do not take our word for it. Search our house if you like. I will. Tom. Just a minute, Mary. What are you doing? Right here on this table. Mr. Weber, a couple of packs of American cigarettes here. And what do you know? They're my brother's brand. Sergeant, Sergeant. You know American cigarettes are a favorite all over Europe. Millions of Europeans buy them. Tommy's right. I wish we could help you, Sergeant. Your brother's brand, does he own them? Is he the only one in the world who smokes them? Oh, Max, these people are feeling very badly. They have just been given a bad fright. Do not be sarcastic. We should try to help them. Yes, yes. I suggest that if you are worried about your brother, you go to the police. Mary, I wish I knew what to do. Well, what can we do, Tom? The police yeah. said... Yeah. Yeah, the police. Okay, to them it's routine. They'll look, and if they find them, they find them. Now, this uh, Mr. and Mrs. Weber, they're lying, Mary. They have to be lying. But the police told us they were respectable people. Yeah, I know, I know. But I just can't sit here and worry. I have to do something. What? I don't know. Hey, if it isn't the biggest gold brick in the United States Army. What? Hagen. Haken, how did you ever become a such? <laughs> how are you, how kid? Tom? Good to see you. Oh, uh, honey, this, this is Bill Haken. Hello. We uh, took basic Hi. training together at Fort Benning, Georgia. So you remember me? Well, I haven't seen you since uh, 1943. Hey, you haven't changed a bit. Uh, meet Mary Edwards. Say, hey, Sergeant, a girl like you could do a lot better. Well, I know, but I'm willing to settle for him. Well, let me pull up a chair. We got, let's see... Eleven years to talk about uh, Without it. me, fellas, I know his life history by heart. <laughs> Listen, Tom, mm. I have a hunch. Eddie said he worked for a film company in Paris. Did he say which one? No. Let's figure it's an American company. I'll make some calls. I'll try all of them. If I can reach the right one, maybe they'll be able to tell us something about Eddie. Hey, hey, what's up? Oh, I don't know, Bill. My crazy kid brother's disappeared on me. I got a first-class mystery on my hands. Yeah, well, tell me about it. I'm with the Provo Marshal's office. Who knows? I might be useful.
And, uh, what makes you think these people are lying? Well, they have to be telling a lie. Something happened to Eddie and they're not talking. Tom, listen. I was in luck. Oh? I called Paris and I tracked down the company. Uh -huh. It's an outfit called American Universal. They flew Eddie out from New York last Tuesday and sent him to Mannheim on Thursday. That part of it checks. Well, have they heard from Eddie? No, they expect him back tomorrow with some films. Bill, is, isn't there anything we can do to those people? Isn't there some way we can get the story out of them? Look, in these things, Tom, you can't be a bull in a china shop. Now you say the German police were told the story. They say the Webbers are legitimate. Now, what more can you do? All I know is Eddie told me he was there. How do you account for those packs of American cigarettes? Eddie's brand, too. Oh, but you and I know hundreds of German civilians who buy American... Who buy... Hey, Tom, did you get a good look at the pack? Yeah, I got a good look at the pack. It was just an ordinary pack of king size. Oh, that's not what I mean at all. Let's get out of here. I think we could use some help. Sir, the missing man is the brother of an American soldier. But the man himself is a civilian. Oh, yes, sir, but he's an American. If the missing man were a soldier, then naturally this office would have to enter the picture. That would definitely be our job. I know that, sir, but Mr. Brown... Sergeant Hagen, even though this missing man is a civilian, the very fact that he is an American citizen in trouble would cause interest to the Provo Marshal's office. We'd certainly lend any assistance we could within the limits of our duties, but... Frankly, Sergeant, I don't quite understand the problem. A man has disappeared, sir. But the German authorities were notified. They're satisfied that no foul play is involved. These people, uh, what's their name, Weber? They're above and beyond suspicion. Oh, well, Sergeant, I, I just don't know what official move this office can make. Well, is there any objection to my making a few unofficial moves during my off-duty hours, sir? Not at all, Sergeant Hagen. And let me tell you this. If you uncover anything to show that an American citizen has been the victim of any criminal act, then this office will get into it, officially. That's the house? Yeah. Mary, give us two minutes in the house, then you ring the bell. Why can't we all go in together? Because we have to distract their attention. When you ring the bell, one of them will have to leave us to go to the door. Oh, all right. Now, Tom, understand. Our only purpose in going inside is to swipe a pack of those cigarettes. Now, what's a pack of cigarettes going to prove? You yourself, sir. Tom, this is a long shot. If I'm right, I'll explain later. If I'm wrong, we can forget the whole thing. Now, let's go. Two minutes, Mary. No more, no less. And whatever you do, don't let them see you take the cigarettes. Uh, Mr. Weber, the other day you said I could search your house to prove to myself that my brother hadn't been there. Well, yes. Well, is that offer still good? Oh, it's the American soldier. Yes, ma'am. Had the police been of any help? They were here, you know. We could not tell them anything. Well, do you mind if we come in? Sergeant, I insist that you come in. Search our home and convince yourself we are telling the truth. That's fair enough. Please, go ahead. Upstairs, downstairs, the attic, the cellar. I got a cigarette, Tom? I must have left mine in the restaurant. Oh, sure, here. Oh, I can't smoke them. Huh? Oh, I, I, I noticed a pack of uh, your brand last time I was here. Could you uh, give my friend a cigarette, her weapon? Uh, of course, uh, on the table, Margaret. Yes. Have one, sir. Oh, thank you. I understand how upset and nervous you must be, Sergeant. In your place, I would feel the same. Say, that's some piece of china you got on the sideboard, madam. I have an aunt who goes nuts over stuff like that. I know a shop where they sell others like it. Perhaps you would like to buy some for her. Oh, please, excuse me. Any time you wish to start searching, gentlemen. Is the American sergeant here? Oh, Tom, I've been looking for you. Hey, I'm glad you showed up, Mary. Tom wants to inconvenience these good people by searching their house. Now, I don't think that's necessary. I think they told him the truth. Oh, thank you, sir. Tom, you can't go around accusing people and bothering them. You know, they can report you. Folks, if he continues to make a pest out of himself, go to the Provo Marshal's office. Well, this is ridiculous. I don't even think you have a brother. How do you like that? And now, listen here. Now, uh, you listen to me, Tom. Let these people alone. You caused them enough trouble. Now, let's get out of here before you get into some yourself. Sorry we bothered you, folks. Good night. Well, good night. Let us know if you find your brother. Well... You know, for a minute there, you had me scared. Did you get the cigarettes? They took their eyes off me the minute you rang the bell. I slipped the pack in my pocket. Okay, okay, Sherlock Holmes. So now, what do you know? I know both of them were lying. I know your brother was in that house.
You are listening to the proudly we hail production, Appointment in Mannheim. We'll return in just a moment for the second act. You know, it's a far cry from the twanging banjos and mandolins of the early 20s to the complex instrumentation of modern music of the 50s. And with such thinking in mind, I'd like to remind you, young gentlemen listening, that you don't want to let old ideas about army life give you a slanted version of the wonderful outfit your Uncle Sam is running these days. Now, for some years, every man in the United States Army has been a fellow who's specially welcomed and honored by any American citizen and by all American communities. As you realize, Army service is an important part of the life of many young men. Today's modern Army lets you select schooling of your choice, gives you a guarantee in writing that you will get that schooling and that all happens before you enlist. Today's Army tells you to pick your branch within the Army, then put you there. See what's in it for you. Learn at your nearest recruiting station downtown about starting off a career alongside big Americans in the United States Army. You are listening to Proudly We Hail. Now we present the second act of Appointment in Mannheim. It was to be a reunion between two brothers, one an American sergeant stationed in Germany, the other an American civilian traveling through Europe. But when Sergeant Rhodes showed up at the address given him by his brother, the people who lived there claimed they never heard of him. But Sergeant Hagen of the Provo Marshal's office has discovered that someone was lying. I believe we have seen the last of them. Oh, I hope so. Suppose they had searched the cellar. They would never have found the trap door. What are we to do with him? I think he could be useful to our side. I say get rid of him. We can always get rid of him. If we can get him to our people in East Berlin, I would say that after a concentrated indoctrination period, he would be an asset. He is a fine photographer. Specialists are always welcome. Ah, give me a cigarette. How these things work out. You let him use your dark room, and that stupid Eric had left those microfilms lying about. <laughs> What is the matter? Wasn't there an open package of cigarettes? Of course I gave the American one from it. But it isn't here. It must have fallen to the floor. Those cigarettes. They made the Americans suspicious from the beginning. Oh, but what can you prove by an ordinary pack of cigarettes? I do not know. But if they're not here, there's only one answer. The soldier must have taken them. But why? I do not know why. Perhaps, uh, perhaps an unconscious, instinctive gesture. He absently placed them in his pocket. Why did they come here? And why did they leave so suddenly? What do they know? What do they suspect? Why are the cigarettes missing? Margaret, you place too much importance on something which probably means nothing. The reason you and I have never failed in any mission is because I place importance on everything. To me, nothing is meaningless. We leave for Berlin tonight. What of the one downstairs? If Eric can get us a truck, we shall take him. Otherwise, well, we will make sure he will be unable to talk. But we cannot be sure the others suspect. I have no intention of risking prison to find out. Where can you buy American cigarettes in this country? Hmm? Or a PX or an army store? Or the German store. Right. And they're exactly the same as the same brands made and sold in America. One difference. The ones you buy here have something missing on the outside. A tax stamp. One week ago, where was your brother? In New York. Okay. So he bought himself a couple of packs of cigarettes, or maybe four or five for the trip overseas. Every pack of cigarettes sold in New York has a special sales tax stamp on it. Now, here's the pack I swiped from the Weber's. Let me ask you this. What's that New York City sales tax stamp doing on the bottom of it? Why, it means this pack was bought in New York. I knew it. Let's go back there and tear that joint apart. Well, we don't have them yet. This is just one little bit of circumstantial evidence. We need more. Now, maybe you do. I don't. Wise up. There's something big going on here. We have to find out what it is. Now, look, I'm worried about my brother. Well, I'm worried about him, too, but we have to know what we're doing first. Fellas, fellas, don't look now, but that waiter leaning against the wall is staring at us. Is he our waiter? No. Are you sure he's staring? Positive. But now he's headed this way. Hmm, interesting. Do you mean this isn't enough to go to the authorities with? Well, not by itself. Look, I'm going to talk with Mr. Brown. He's the warrant officer in our unit. The waiter with the pop eyes is going to walk past the table. Well, what can we lose? I'm going to try something. 
Uh, say, uh, waiter. Oh, I am not your waiter, but I will call him if you wish to be served. Tell me, who were you staring at, and why? I, sir? I was not staring. Yeah, yeah, I was. At this sergeant. At me, why? Well, I thought for a moment you were the same American gentleman who I had served in here a few nights ago. But no, he, he was a civilian, and you are a soldier. Ah, but you look so much alike. And now I see you are old. Yeah? And he looked like this sergeant, you say? Oh, yeah, yeah. He could have been your brother. Yeah, I remember him well. He was very nice. I was careless with the clay, and I spilled some gravy on his jacket. But he laughed, and he said, forget it. Uh, what else do you know about this American? Well, he was in here just once. It was a Wednesday night. I spilled the gravy on him, and he asked me where could he have it cleaned. So I sent him to a tailor shop across the street. Let's go. Now, Mr. Hoffman, think. Did an American bring a jacket in here to be cleaned? Uh, I must say, think. How many American civilians have I among my customers? Yeah, yeah, I remember him. He looked like, uh, why, uh, just like this sergeant. But where did he go after he left the jacket? I told him the jacket would be ready the next day. One does not just wash off such a blemish. One must be careful not to damage the cloth. Uh, yeah, yeah, but where'd he go? Uh, he never called for the jacket. I wonder what happened to him. I offered to deliver it, but he said he would call. Well, do you have a ticket or a receipt or something with his name and address? Uh, Sergeant, I am a businessman. I insist on names, addresses, receipts. Well, what does it say on that paper on the jacket? Uh, let me put on my glasses. Uh, so, it reads Edward Rhodes, 7 6 Cafetelstrasse. <laughs> Mr. Hoffman, there isn't going to be any trouble. All you have to do is deliver the jacket. There won't be any trouble. Uh, there'll be military police and civilian authorities covering the house. You you won't be in any danger. Oh, so that is too bad. I, I beg your pardon? Uh, for ten years I've been a tailor. I work all day in the shop. I was hoping that here might be a little excitement. Well, there might be a little excitement at that. Uh, tell me, you know these people, the Webbers? Well, no, them. By sight, I know them. Sometimes they bring the cleaning to me. Good. Mr. Brown, what can I do? Nothing, Sergeant Rhodes. You did your share already. Now it's time for the proper authorities to make their move. I have here a quote from Mr. Edward Rhodes. Mr. Edward Rhodes? Is he at but... home? He, he told me he was staying at your house, Herr Weber. Here, I have it written on the ticket. Oh, yes, of course. Come in. Uh, let me have the quote. But uh, where's Mr. Rhodes? He left unexpectedly for Paris. We will send him the quote. Someone is at the door. Look through the window first. Margaret. Soldier. Police. They sent you here to trap us. No, no, I merely deliver a court. You shouldn't have let him in. You should have denied everything. How? Perhaps I cannot find the hiding place in the basement quickly. Uh, what about this one? Shoot him. Oh. Drop it, Max. Oh. All right, don't anybody move. Now, where's Eddie Rhodes? They said something about a hiding place in the basement. Take this place apart brick by brick if you have to. Find him. Uh, you sure caused me a lot of trouble. Well, it was worth it, Eddie. We turned those two over to intelligence. Espionage is their baby. But, Eddie, what made them want to kidnap you? Well, he was a photographer. And I asked him if I could use his darkroom. Oh, would you believe it? There on the table, negatives of the latest model atomic rocket launchers. I almost dropped dead. I didn't know what to do. Then he walked into the room, sized everything up, and pulled a gun on me. 
Boy, that's all I knew till the soldiers came. Oh, it never fails. Every time I have to meet you, something happens. <laughs> well, Tom, these people are big wheels. They told me they were the top communist agents in Mannheim. Hmm, they may have been at the top yesterday, but they're down at the bottom right now. It's all because they were greedy for your cigarette. Yeah. Well, look, Mary and I are getting married next Sunday. Now, do you think you can make it? Or are you going to be captured by red agents or kidnapped by black marketeers? <laughs> can you once in your life show up without getting into a jam? I don't know, Tom, but I'll try. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, Eddie, but I'm glad I'm in the Army, where everything runs so smoothly and peacefully. Boy, these civilians sure take chances, don't they, Tom? If you are a young man of service age and expect to serve a tour of duty in the near future, I'd like to tell you about a training program that may help you a great deal in planning for military life. It's called the Reserved for You Training Program. Completely realistic and up-to-date, it gives you an opportunity to choose your own technical training before you enlist. Now, first you make written application, choosing from 87 different technical training courses. Now, if you qualify and a vacancy exists, you'll receive a letter telling you that you have a reserved seat in the course. And this letter is mighty important to you because it is your written guarantee that you will attend the course of your choice, where you'll learn, get on-the-job training, and serve your country at the same time. Of course, the decision must be made by you. And to give you the complete facts in making this decision, we've prepared a colorful booklet called Reserved for You, and it's yours for the asking. I suggest that you put your name and address on a postcard and mail it to RPC, Governor's Island, New York 4, New York. Here's that address again. Jot it down. RPC, Governor's Island, New York 4. And the name of the booklet to ask for is Reserved for You. And if you have any slanted ideas about Army life, this booklet will bring you up to date on the outfit your Uncle Sam is running these days. Drop us a card and find out for yourself. That address once more, RPC, Governor's Island, New York 4. We'd be very happy to send you a free copy of the booklet reserved for you. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Center in New York for the United States Army Recruiting Service, and this is Mark Hamilton speaking, inviting you to tune in this same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail.